Okay, here we are. Good evening, CASM members, and thank you for uh, taking the time to join us this evening for this webinar. My name is Kathy J. Campbell, and I was co-chair of this committee with Steve Keeler, who you'll meet shortly as well. We all hope that you are taking good care of yourselves, your families, your loved ones, and your sports teams as well. It has been an incredibly difficult and uh, strange time to say the least. Our talk tonight is the updated team physician remuneration guidelines. If I could have the next slide, Helen. And our agenda will be to briefly discuss uh, three areas that uh, the committee investigated. Uh, firstly, uh, Steve and Marnie are gonna discuss how we collected the data and give a little information about that, about our survey that you all kindly filled out for us. Patty and Bob will give a summary of the position statement. And uh, by the way, we're very grateful to the previous uh, committee uh, members that uh, produced the statement, the last one being 2011, and Bob will comment on that further. And thirdly, uh, Tina and uh, Cole, who I think is stuck in the OR tonight, but Tina thankfully is here, and she's going to review the contract template uh, that we produced. A couple of housekeeping things. Number one, if you have any questions at all, please put them in the Q&A section during the Q&A uh, period. Uh, you, you're welcome to chat and, and talk through the chat box, but if you could put specific questions in the Q&A. And if you are during the Q&A section, uh, if you are dying to uh, speak uh, and you can't fit it all in in the Q&A, please raise your hand and uh, Helen's going to be a Hawkeye for us and unmute you uh, to give your uh, question or comment or experience or whatever uh, you would like to offer. Uh, but we will only hear your voice. So we will ask that you um, give your full name and your location. Also, uh, Helen is gonna post all the links of these different areas in the chat box tonight. And finally, we will stop at 9.30 tonight if you're trying to schedule and plan for your day. And 9.30 means Eastern time where, where I'm sitting from. So it's eight to 9.30. But as uh, Bob generously offered, uh, we are gonna stay on if there are further questions. Next uh, slide. So briefly, the creation of this guideline for physician remuneration evolved from the concern expressed by sport and exercise medicine physicians across Canada that our expert medical services are often uh, expected on a voluntary basis. This guideline does not imply that sport and exercise medicine physicians should not volunteer their time uh, with amateur athletes or cover local events. The long tradition of volunteerism is one that we're all proud of um, and shouldn't be lost. But given the added complexities that we're dealing with uh, today with increased risk, time commitments, huge time commitments for, for many of them as we gleaned from the, from the survey, the medical legal liabilities in certain situations associated with sport medicine coverage, and in particular with the elite and high performance sports teams, there is a growing concern uh, about appropriate financial compensation, compensation of such services and a standardization of remuneration rates across Canada. And again, we're very grateful to previous uh, authors. Um, next slide. And finally, before I hand off to, uh, to Steve, the, who was our co-chair, Steve and to Marnie, um, the, uh, quickly introduce. So in the going from left to right, starting in the top row, we had Patty McCluskey from, Van, from uh, British Columbia. We have Tina Atkinson from Nova Scotia, Marnie Westner from Alberta, uh, Cole Beavis, who's stuck in the OR tonight from uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, I'm from Halifax, I'd get killed if I said otherwise, but uh, I am living in uh, Ontario. 
uh, Bob McCormick from British Columbia, Steve Keeler from uh, British Columbia, and Don uh, Howarth, our executive director in uh, Ottawa, Ontario. And also special thanks to Helen Howarth, uh, who helped enormously from the uh, CASM office in helping us put this together. So with that, uh, I want to thank, uh, thank the committee and uh, I will hand over to Steve Keeler to start things off. Great. Uh, thanks, Kathy. Um, I appreciate the intro um, and thanks to everybody for joining us tonight and hope everybody is staying safe in the various hibernating holes in Canada right now. We're trying to hide out in for a while longer. Um, and thanks for taking the time tonight. Um, so Marnie and I are gonna do our best to blast through the survey, but I, along with some of the thanks that Kathy gave, I just wanna mention this bright smiley face on the slide there. Um, this is um, Kathy's nephew, John, who was instrumental helping us with uh, with the data collection and uh, creation of the PowerPoint. Um, John lives here in Victoria and he's uh, um, working, I think, in health and information and has a master's in Indigenous health and just an all around uh, helpful guy with this process. So thanks, John. I don't know if you're on with us tonight or not. Um, so Marty and I will do our best to really blast through the survey. Our, 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 the purpose of presenting the survey tonight is really just to sort of show you some of the answers to the questions that we posed to you guys. And thank you again, over hundred people responded to the survey, which was really helpful. Um, and it's, but it's really the output um, from the survey that I think we wanna to get to tonight and spend more time on that being uh, the new remuneration guidelines that Bob and Patty will go through. And then some of the contract uh, discussion around the new template. Um, this idea, you know, has been brewing in my head for a while as part of the team physician uh, committee co-chair with Terry DeFreitas, and I had been wanting a template of this for a while um, to try to help new to sport docs, but also um, those of us existing in sport really try to dial in our, um, you know, our financial relationships with the various sport organizations we work with. And so the purpose of the survey was really just to get a bit of a, the landscape of our financial arrangements. And you'll see from some of the answers, I think what it did do is help um, with establishment of those remuneration guidelines and just in some of the numbers that you'll be presented a little later. Um, I know personally, I've been on both sides of the coin when it comes to um, financial arrangements with Tri-Canada for years. There wasn't a whole lot of compensation. In fact, it was a money losing venture for me as I know many on the call probably experienced as well. And now I have a decent fair contract with Swimming Canada. So I hope that there'll be some benefit with that contract um, template for you guys. Um, so this all started back in the spring. It was, I think, Tatjana who sent an email question to the team physician committee asking for um, advice on remuneration for event coverage. And it led to a whole flurry of emails um, from some very seasoned veteran sport docs, just about past experiences with regard to money and, and our work we do in sport. And um, it evolved out of that. And then I think Kathy came on board with some direction from the board to look at the revision of the guidelines. And and I don't know if any of you have had a chance to work with Kathy on any committees, but we moved ahead at pretty warp speed after that um, to get this up and running. So thanks to Kathy um, for the guiding light here with this project. So I'm going to turn it over to Marnie for the first few questions, and then I'll jump back in. And like I say, we're really trying to get through this fairly quickly. So if there's any specific questions about some of the data we may have collected or the comments, please put them in the question box. So thanks, and over to you, Marnie. Okay, next slide, please, Helen. So you can see where this um, was purposeful, purposeful sampling, obviously, of CASM membership. And the vast majority of people do hold a CASM diploma and actually indicate that they are a sport medicine physician. Um, over 90% of the survey respondents did have a CASM diploma. Next slide, Helen. 
this was some interesting data. And when we looked at the membership across the whole, when you look at the people that are responding, the majority of people had less than 10 years experience in sport medicine. And when I kind of considered this across the spectrum of someone's social life, I look at it in the idea that the majority of respondents are in the formative stages of their career. And that when those numbers drop off in the middle years, that's sort of akin to when people's lives are getting busy with their career, with their family, and perhaps participation in sports and team events drops off until they get into the latter part of the years again, when they're closer to retirement or slow tiring. And you see a bit of a bump in the number of people in the respondents here. Can you, next slide, please. We tried to figure out or gain an understanding from everybody participating in this, what type of practice they have. The vast majority of people identified as having a combination practice in family medicine and sports or emergency medicine and sports. The distribution of the respondents was proportional to the overall CHASM membership. And some of the surprising responses was the other. Um, we had everything from addiction medicine to aesthetics, but I suspect those were people who are previously very involved in team sports. And as they're slow tiring, have transitioned their practice into other things, but their information is certainly valid in, in the survey. What I would like to see, sorry, back, can we go back to that other slide? What we did not capture a lot in this was respondents from CHASM membership that are not participating in team involvement in any or in different capacities. So I think in future studies, when we do this again, it would be very good if we could make a bigger push to get a broader scope of CHASM membership, especially those that are not heavily or actively involved in teams, because I think they have just as much to say about why they don't get involved in teamwork as those that are heavily involved and the factors that we complain about. So I think there's still a lot to can be learned the next go around at this um, survey model. Next slide. So we tried to um, break down what most people are participating in and the capacity in which they participate in different teams. Most of the respondents that we had were physicians that are involved in national sport organizations or involved in university sports programs. The most common manner of involvement was physicians traveling as part of a team and providing pre-participation physical examinations. And 86% of the respondents indicated they do provide event coverage. In the lower levels of sport participation, most physicians indicated they prov provided more of an advisory role to the teams that they serve. And in the upper levels of sport participation, so like junior, up, um, junior level sport, NSO, U sport or, or higher, most respondents identified as being a team or a traveling physician. But the vast majority of people actually had multiple roles with the multiple teams that they participated with. Next slide. Steve's so, this one. Yeah, so I'll jump back in here. Thanks, Marnie. Um, question five on the survey um, essentially just looks at the variety of the different types of services we provide. Um, and the main areas that we did look at are the clinical care of the athlete, team travel, volunteerism, pre-participation medicals, national team camp coverage, policy and admin work, and coordination of care with allied health professionals. And as I said, we're just in the interest of time tonight. We're just going to, I'm not going to go through all the individual numbers here, but I just wanted to make the key point with this slide that we do a ton of work. And um, a lot of that work is not financially compensated. Um, a lot of people, you can see a lot of the responses were in that five day plus range. And we could have taken the survey out a little further there, I think, um, to capture a bit more of the actual time commitment. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide and this question speaks to contracts and the first pie chart you'll see, I guess on the left hand side is, have you a written contract for the medical services supplied? And a little surprising here, um, you can see quite a significant number of us working in Canada do not have a contract um, that outlines any details of our relationship. And if you go to the middle pie chart, you'll see that, um, for those of you that do work under a contract, it's not really well 
outline the compensation or the service provision expectations. It's about split. And the, I think that that speaks to one, the real need for contracts and at least the purpose of having a template that you can use. Um, I think it really um, will help us and help those individuals new to the sport um, establish themselves or at least have a negotiating tool. Um, the third pie chart um, looks at, it's kind of an outlier here, I guess, but it just looks at, you know, are you billing provincial medical service plans? And a number of people, clearly the majority are. And I wasn't sure whether to bring this up or not, or it's whether it's a discussion point for this venue or perhaps in the, in the question and answer period, but it's an interesting dynamic between having a contract and having um, services really well laid out in a contract versus whether we're billing fee for service and potentially that, that concept of double dipping and the ethics and you know, our responsibility around that. And um, I think it's another reason why most of us working should have a contract that is well-defined so that those expectations are there and the fee for service is separate from that. Um, so just, again, more emphasis around this. And we can talk about that toward the end of the uh, discussion. Uh, next slide, please. So this is fairly straightforward. If you are monetarily compensated for your medical time and services uh, that you provide to a team, how are you paid? And um, lots of variation here, yearly stipend per diem, monthly stipend, personally I'm paid quarterly. Um, you know, the other category was, um, you know, had a large response rate and that being kind of hourly um, paid per event, weekend stipends. But the thing that came out of this and in the comments section was that compensation is highly variable um, depending on what level of service you're providing, whether it's national university or professional teams. Um, next slide, please. Um, also found this interesting, you know, again, personally, I never was aware of who on the IST, um, the integrated sport team, um, you know, were being paid and how much they were being paid until I asked recently. And I think this is also important if you are entering into a conversation with whoever the employer might be, um, who, who, who else on the team is receiving compensation and what that might be. I think it just helps um, position yourself within those negotiation. Um, but most of us are a significant percentage were unaware of whether allied health professionals were paid within the IST. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I think we're back to Marnie for that one. Yeah, this is me wearing my qualitative research hat now. With this data I looked at in using qualitative methods to analyze it, and we had a significant number of respondents indicate that they lost revenue and incurred expenses because of the work that they do with teams. So 73% of people were losing revenue. In looking at these, the data from this question, I looked at inductive contact and analysis and global analysis to find some common themes. And the saturation of the data for this question was extremely high. And there were some four consistent themes that came out of that, being that as physicians who work with teams, we're losing fee-for-service income and or overhead expenses. We're losing vacation, family, and CME time by working with teams. We incur medical supply expenses as well as car and parking expenses. And if we go to the next slide, I thought it was important to um, actually highlight for you some of these in vivo codes that were basically verbatim comments from some of the respondents, um, such as they've lost eight weeks a year in fee-for-service billing and pay those eight weeks overhead each year. Uh, overhead in my office is currently around 400 to 450 per day, whether I'm there or not. It typically costs me $650 per bag to fill. Lost revenue is approximately thirty to sixty thousand dollars per year. The NSO is not willingly acknowledging that MDs are part of a small business owner with fixed costs, and the amount of payment is half of that that you'd be able to bill through third-party medical building and the healthcare system. So I think this is, to me, is a very telling slide: is that we're losing a lot of money and giving up a lot in sacrificing personal time by our work with teams. Next slide.
Yeah, th thanks, Marty, again. Um, so question 10, um, really, uh, it's going to be the next few slides here. It, it sort of helped form some of the basis to the um, remuneration guidelines, because it really is was asking what are your financial expectations um, under a number of categories, per diem being those incidentals when you're traveling, for example, parking and meals, um, and that range between zero to, you know, typically kind of in that 50 to $100 range. But then it went on to look at what would your expectations be for an annual stipend, um, an on daily honoraria, monthly stipend. And, you know, generally, you know, to summarize expectations for um, money was based on, you know, duties and time commitment per activity and most expected a minimum to cover office overhead expenses that Marnie had just mentioned where we're losing money. Um, next slide, uh, Helen, thanks. And here are a few more categories that were looked at as well. A chief medical officer at major games, university sport, you know, chief medical officer for NSO and then medical officer for a large event like an Ironman, um, medical officer for a community event and so on. And again, responses were highly variable. Most were based on time commitment. Expectations were around hourly ranges between one and $300 an hour, but admittedly, um, answers were all over the map with this and difficult to accurately assess. But some comments around this is that generally our time commitment are typically under undervalued or appreciated from a financial perspective, not necessarily from a thank you for showing up. Uh, next slide. And um, just a couple of other categories with, again, um, the membership financial expectations. And um, here's pre-participation medical and event hourly. There was a little confusion around the question, I think, with the pre-participation medical. Some people answered per um, athlete versus per hour. Um, generally, the numbers were between one and $150 an hour for that service. Um, the small um, sidebar there is um, major junior teams, uh, professional teams. And interestingly, now with core medical team um, at major games, um, there is some, uh, I believe, stipend. Bob may mention that um, going forward. Uh, next slide, please. Um, fairly straightforward. If you are a traveling team physician, please estimate um, the number of trips per year and the number of travel weeks per year. Um, again, just showing our commitment to sport, um, one to two uh, trips per year, one to two weeks on it, you know, we're the highest response rate and the number of, number of travel weeks. But you can see there are some physicians in, in Canada that are traveling, you know, five plus weeks, um, which is a huge time commitment and I'm sure uh, a loss financially for those docs. Uh, next slide, please. I found this interesting that still at this uh, day and age, uh, we're still at times seeing doctors who are paying their hotels and flights and meals and so on to travel with teams. Um, you know, the one that stands out to me is the medical supplies. Um, again, lots of experience here on this webinar and I, I know my bag costs between one and $2,000 a year to keep it up to date um, with usage and expired um, supplies. And that's written into my contract that that's going to be paid for by Swimming Canada. And I think some of this stuff um, it just serves as a, a background or points that could be included in, in contracts going forward uh, when negotiating. Um, yeah, I will just move on to the next slide. Thanks. Um, I have to look at this each time um, to try to sort it out. But these are the non-monetary offerings for services that we do provide and what is important to us. And um, so it's not always about a financial compensation. Uh, team clothing ranked fairly high um, in the respondents' uh, choices, meals during events, parking. Um, a big one there is personal recognition, um, promotion and program brochures and, and whatnot. Um, yeah, so a few extra things, event tickets. So it, it sometimes doesn't take a lot uh, to keep us happy, but those would be some of the non-monetary things. Uh, next slide, please. So um, tons of comments and thank you very much for, um, for those. Um, they in some ways were maybe a bit more valuable than just the actual uh, scoring that we did. Um, some common themes, people were generally really appreciated to be entering in this kind of conversation and creation of this template. Um, 
for the con with the contract. Lots of positive comments about the position paper that will be presented. Um, Interestingly, there was a lot of resentment, um, you know, people who over the years have felt taken advantage of, taken for granted, not properly compensated, lots of lost revenue comments, um, which may come up tonight, um, feeling we should be paid for these services um, a little bit more consistently. Um, and a few comments on the survey, we realized that some of the questions were a little puzzling, perhaps uh, Marnie and I were were survey virgins at the time and we could have used a little bit of professional help with it, but I do think it served to capture some ideas and some numbers that um, will be useful moving forward. And um, so I think I'll just leave it at that. Uh, we wanna get more to the other, um, the other output stuff from it. Um, and there's Bob just uh, tuned in. So I just like to briefly introduce uh, Drs. Bob McCormick, McCormick and I think Patty's with us, I haven't seen him yet. Um, who will bring to us a wealth of experience on some, for sure, on individual team um, medical coverage, but also from a national perspective as well. And uh, with their role on a national level are, are trying to bring this forward to some of the decision makers when it comes to contracts and physician remuneration. So thanks for listening and uh, thanks, Bob and Patty. Oh, thank you, Steve. And um, so the questionnaire kind of led really to the generation of this position uh, statement that Patty and I are going to present. Um, it is a little bit dense, but everybody received uh, copies of it or will be able to get it on the website. So you don't have to focus too much on the, on the, on the numbers, but the, the idea is that we're going to give you some tools that will help you negotiate with those that want to engage your services. So just first off, I'll just have to start with a little history. The first and actually the existing rate card that we use that helps us uh, define or the value of our services was actually developed in a room in Banff. And I remember that exact day in 2007. And so for example, we said on a daily rate for physicians, it should be between 500 and $750 a day. Um, interestingly, it, the reason we put a range is to reflect the fact that there may be less experienced or experts in the field that, you know, that uh, might command slightly different rates. Uh, on the podium decided to pick the number right in the middle. Uh, and we've stuck with that now for 13 years. So obviously it's a little bit out of date. Uh, CASM has had uh, previous versions of the position paper led by uh, the, the, the past chairs of the uh, team physician committee. A number of people have been involved probably on this call, including Paul Watson, Laura Cruz, Tiana, um, Eric Babbins. Lots of people have contributed, but we felt it was due for an update. It's, uh, it's been a while. Um, sports have become much more professional. All levels of sports, there's a higher degree of professionalism, and that has implications for us, not only in terms of the ask for us and the responsibilities we assume, but the the, uh, the, the amount of work that we have to do and, and the value of that work. So on top of that, as was pointed out, others on the, on the support team are being paid. If you looked at that uh, questionnaire, 10% of the rest of the IST are not getting paid. Sometimes we don't know, but only 10% that are not being paid. So we're in the minority if we're not getting some form of comp compensation. So the idea is that we need to have some tools to be able to talk to the sports. It's a challenging conversation, at least at the front end, but we can talk about some, some strategies for that, but some tools to help you put into perspective and make the argument. So there's lots of things that are going to modify the, the ask, uh, the risk of the sport, the amount of responsibility, of course, the time involved, your experience. And, um, and what we're gonna do is get Patty to kind of go through some of those things because it, it, going back to the questionnaire, as Steve mentioned, there was sort of a, a range of $100 to $300 per hour. Well, it may be a little bit different for a community sport than it is for a professional team. And so Patty is going to go through some of those things that can kind of, uh, uh, the modifiers, the things, the benefits, the costs of being in sport, the various levels of, of physicians that you, you can sort of take the notes from those that when you're having the discussions, you um, uh, can hopefully make it easier for you. So with that, I'm gonna 
turn it over to Patty. I'll come back with a little bit of a summary at the end. And uh, Patty McCloskey, who um, many of you will know, has been a real leader in sports medicine. He's not only the head physician for Athletics Canada and triathlon, but the CMO for the Canadian Sports Institute in uh, uh, Canadian Sport Institute Pacific. And uh, I, he's someone I really like to listen to. He's a very thoughtful person who's uh, always got a uh, sound perspective and he's, and he's a quality physician. So with that, Helen will bring up the next slide for Patty. Uh, Bob, th that's might be the best introduction I ever had in my life. I, I hope somebody has a recording of that. So thank you for those very kind words. Um, as Bob said, I'm just going to go through some of the things that, you know, as a team physician that you would consider, you know, as modifying factors as you communicate and speak to the sport about how you might be remunerated for your involvement. But important to note that there are some uh, non-monetary things that uh, are of value. Uh, Steve and Marty alluded to them in the questionnaire, having your name associated with the team, um, you know, being part of an Olympic Games team, uh, you know, that carries a level of recognition that uh, is, uh, can elevate your standing in a community. Um, often being part of the team, you know, means you're considered an expert and, uh, but also like, don't want to deny that there's a lot of self-satisfaction and gratification that comes from being involved with the sport, perhaps one that you yourself used to participate in. Um, other monetary value type things, uh, again, Stephen alluded to a lot of this in, in the questionnaire, team apparel, um, travel expenses, uh, daily per diems that they give you. This is meant to reflect uh, per diems while you're traveling, uh, the costs that you might incur while you're traveling. Uh, honorariums, uh, hourly, daily, weekly, per session, per event. Um, sometimes there's the possibility to bill for medical services. Um, Steve had uh, highlighted this, you need to be careful not to be inappropriately double billing. So that would be where you're being paid to see athletes and then you're also uh, then billing the medical services plan for uh, seeing those athletes. Sometimes uh, you're able to get access to sports equipment or training facilities. Um, Sometimes, particularly in professional teams, uh, they're able to help you provide adequate medical liability insurance. So I'm going to go through these next five levels of team position. And again, these are just modifying factors meant to acknowledge that there's a difference being involved in a community soccer program versus being involved in the local university soccer program versus being involved in the national soccer team versus being involved uh, as uh, a lead position for FIFA, an event that's hosted in Canada, or um, working for a professional soccer team. And so at level one, you know, this is meant to be the lower level, uh, medical advisor for some community amateur sport organizations. And, uh, you know, the, 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 often it's not a team, but it's more a, a league that you're helping out with, maybe providing some guidance on concussion protocols, like how a league might mandate or modify that. Um, so, and typically these are sports maybe with lower injury rates or when injuries occur, they, they don't tend to be severe injuries. Um, not that you can't really hurt yourself playing golf, but um, as you'll see later on, some of the other sports, uh, there are higher risk sports than playing golf. And so these uh, lower risk sports, baseball, volleyball, golf, hockey, um, soccer, and, and again, you know, there are higher injury rates with hockey, uh, with hockey and soccer and lacrosse, but it's more at the community level. These be, might be considered uh, lower or require lower levels of involvement. Events in this category would be uh, working in small community mass participation events, uh, you know, where like a road race where there's under 100 people, uh, or maybe you're helping out with uh, a dance competition, uh, providing, you know, some medical advice or support to uh, uh, an Irish dancing competition. My daughters do Irish dancing. Um, so if we flip to the next slide. So at the level two, you know, this is the step up now into the college and university ranks. Um, or medical coverage of games at that level or medium sized mass participation events, 100 to 500 participants, or mass participation events with moderate risk of serious injuries. So this would be something like triathlon and cycling. Um, you know, important to note that in these events where people are cycling in groups um, and in packs, uh, people can get sustain a lot of injuries if, uh, if someone in a pack goes down and takes out, uh, you know, a number of people. Uh, or team events where there's more moderate risk of injury. Um, so if you're covering like a junior hockey game or uh, uh, lacrosse game. 
uh, basketball games, uh, you know, where uh, there might be serious head injuries or serious uh, joint injuries. Next slide. And at level three, this is, you know, working with national sporting organizations. And so uh, national uh, amateur sports like uh, athletics or swimming or cycling um, or covering events at the semi-professional level, uh, covering large mass participation events, uh, covering mass participation events with higher risk of energy. So ultra long endurance events like ultra marathons or endurance triathlons. Uh, team events like rugby or uh, American football or ice hockey, where there's uh, particularly at higher levels, where there's uh, more significant risk of um, serious injury or other events with high risk of injury, things like downhill ski events, sliding sports, uh, equestrian events. And the next slide. And then, you know, this is uh, this next level is meant to uh, acknowledge the uh, physicians that are working for professional teams or working in the Canadian Sport Institute network um, or physicians that work with very large mass participation events, large marathons, large triathlons, or if you've been asked to be the CMO for a world championship, uh, professional events, uh, FISU games or Canada games, um, or events with really high expectations for serious injury like boxing or martial arts or mis mixed martial arts. And then the last level, level five, I'll let Bob maybe speak to this uh, as the guy with the most senior experience on the call here in this level. Sorry, slow to come back on. Uh, the, the point that we wanted to make here is that it's actually been very difficult to get compensation uh, for the major games because the franchise holders recognize that um, people want to do it so they can actually take advantage of that. Um, I have been able, sorry, as a group, we've been able to get now some compensation at the Olympics for not only the, the CMO and chief doctor, but also for the core team, which has always been um, a frustration for people in the core that they were, again, the only ones who weren't being paid at the games. Uh, uh, the, the point is, it, it took a lot of work, but we have it now. So there should be a trickle down effect to go to Commonwealth Games, to go to, it, it is at the Pan Am Games, to go to uh, FISU. And the people who are on the call who, have leadership positions in those organizations are the ones who need to take that fight forward. It's very hard for the CMO who's on for one games to try and fight for compensation. They'll just say, listen, that's not the way it works. We'll just get somebody else if you're not prepared to volunteer. So it needs to come from the organization and we need the people that we have in those, those groups to sort of step up and help us get that uh, out to the other franchise holders. Um, next slide. So, Oh, sorry, back to you uh, and <laughs> Patty. Um, you know, maybe make one final comment about the, the level five position in the major games that at our at other countries around the world, you know, our competitors, Australia, England, America, uh, many European countries, those, those are paid positions. And, um, and so just remember that in Canada, you know, we're a bit behind, uh, our, our international colleagues when it comes to remuneration at, at, at some of those higher levels. And so, you know, things that for you to keep in mind when you're being involved with any event that, you know, there's cost to uh, cell phone use and SIM card use and, uh, or, uh, you know, sometimes there's an expectation that uh, you'll need a, a two-way radio. And so th those should be, those could be provided by the events that uh, events you know, should be able to provide you with apparel or a clothing package. And it might not be like the high-end parka that the, the CEO of the event's getting, but you, know, you should get some swag that uh, identifies you as somebody working with the event. Um, if you have to travel, uh, accommodation is a standard that your meals are paid for, your travel expenses are covered, uh, any parking costs, um, that uh, if there's any increase in medical malpractice insurance you need, uh, the, the event should be prepared to provide that. And, you know, for any event that you're going to be involved in, it's really important that you do check with CMPA because uh, depending on your training and your level of experience, you know, th there, there might be a limit to what they're able to provide in terms of malpractice insurance. And so it's always good to communicate with them to clarify how you'll be covered. Um, as an example, I was once traveling with a team internationally and I was told that um, uh, my CMPA would cover me for 
being a physician for the, the athletes on the team, but it did not cover me if I was to provide medical care to the staff. Now, I know others have had a different response, but it, it just highlights how important it is for you to, to have the conversation so that you can document that and be aware of what your coverage is. Um, and then the, you know, for if you're doing pre-participation medical exams, these are examinations that are not covered by MSP or medical services plans. And so, you know, it is appropriate that you ask to be reimbursed your, your time for that. And whether it's on an hourly basis or a per athlete basis, uh, you know, up to you to negotiate. Um, and then, you know, in general, sport medicine services, you, you know, in the group in our discussions, we, we kind of figure that $100 an hour is probably the, the baseline. And then depending on other modifying factors on, you know, the level of the sport you're working with or your own personal experience, the, the rate goes up from there. And so, you know, a, a general range is 100 to 150, 150 now. Um, and then, you know, last part is always, it's appropriate for you to, to inquire about your name and title being included in any, any event program. And then, you know, if there's local events, it's uh, always reasonable to ask for tickets, you know, so your family can attend, uh, meals while you're actually at the event, uh, parking at the event, um, you know, hotel room in the uh, team hotel, if applicable, um, you know, hourly rate versus daily rate, depending on the event. And then, uh, you know, if you're traveling with the team um, as the team's physician, the expectation should always be that your meals, that, that all your travel expenses are paid. Meals, hotel, transportation to and from the venues, uh, cell phone, uh, the data for your cell phone, any medical supplies. And that while you're on the road, unless you have a contract that stipulates that you will travel, that while you're on the road, you get a, a daily honorarium. And so these next few slides, these are kind of the key ones because this is, uh, this is kind of how we've conceptualized how physicians, the, the different ways physicians can be involved. And so this first level is the medical advisor. And so this is meant to highlight that sometimes your involvement is as a minor supporting role to a team that has a well-developed support team. So this, you know, this is a team that has a really experienced coach, kind of knows how to handle a lot of uh, run-of-the-mill injuries or issues that come up. They have an experienced lead therapist that can manage a lot of the common injuries that come up and they may need you just for injuries that aren't responding as expected or maybe something that's not typical or, or maybe something that's more serious. They just want to make certain they get started off on the right foot. But typically these advisor roles, they're small roles. It's a few hours a week. It's emails, maybe some phone communication. Um, you know, you're answering questions. You might you might look at some imaging or interpret some labs and just uh, point people in the right direction on how valid or how um, uh, rel relationable to the issue the, the lab or the imaging results are. Um, and when appropriate, sometimes you're helping to identify a physician or someone else that might be able to be more directly involved. Sometimes that person is you, but then the billing for that would be outside of whatever your agreement is. And so these roles typically don't require you to see athletes in the office and travel is not expected. And, you know, the remuneration is, and sorry, the bottom of the slides cut off here a little bit, but the remuneration is usually $100 an hour um, or, uh, you know, somewhere an annual honorarium of five to $10,000 a year. And there's, there's lots of people, I, I believe even on this call, um, that, that perform roles like this. They help out with national teams. They're not in the same town. They answer some calls, they field some emails, they give some guidance. And when you, you know, when you have a lot of experience, it's easy to provide that guidance. And so it is, you know, a, a minor supporting role, but it does require the team to have a well-developed IST and good experience there. The next level, if we move to the next slide, this is a more involved role, the medical consultant. So this is like a half day or full day a week, including your, the communication. And this, this uh, role, Typically, there's an expectation you're available to see people in the office and provide medical care. Um, you, know, you might be doing intakes, you might be seeing them for injuries, you might be seeing them for other health-related injuries. Um, typically, it's you that's arranging any specialist consultations and any follow-up that's, that's required. Um, you're responding to uh, messages from coaches and athletes. Um, this may be secondary, and it does depend on your availability. I know sometimes, uh, you know, 
if you're working with a big team, it can be overwhelming to receiving lots of texts and emails. And, and my phone just went off a moment ago from one of the teams I work with. So it's, uh, it's just important that you lay out boundaries about how you can be communicated with, who should be reaching out to you. Is it okay that athletes reach out to you directly? Or you know, should they call your office staff? Is it okay that coaches or uh, high performance directors reach out to you directly um, via phone, via email, these kind of things. And it, it's okay for you to set up the boundaries you feel are appropriate. Uh, again, in this role, uh, travel shouldn't be expected. And if there is, there should be, again, a conversation about a daily retainer. And sorry, the slides cut off here again, but the remuneration level for this is, uh, you know, typically fifteen dollars to $40,000 a year is what would be um, typical for this kind of role uh, for a national team. And then if we move to the, the, the third slide here, the CMO role. And so this is a senior leadership role with the integrated support team on a, on a, on a large team. And it, it's typically a big commitment, you know, sometimes up to half, half time. Uh, and I know there's probably some people on the call that, that work even more than that with the team. Uh, and so in addition to the responsibilities of the consultant, somebody in a CMO role would reasonably expect it to provide oversight to team daily programming, including input on travel guidelines, uh, how to be medically prepared at a training camp or competitions. Uh, they might provide guidance on not just doing an intake, but what the intake process should look like, injury prevention programs, emergency action programs for when teams travel, uh, care, standardized care guidelines like uh, uh, for concussion or for ACL injuries or for reds or, or other specific injuries or illnesses that are common to that sport. Uh, Typically, travel is expected in these roles because it is a, a, you're more integrated with the team. Uh, okay to set limits on how much travel you're willing to do. And if they need you to do more, okay to ask for additional funding. And you can just make it out on the bottom here. Typically, these senior leadership roles are in the $35,000 to $75,000 or more a year for, for a CMO role with a national team. And then, uh, you know, the last one, and maybe Bob, I don't know if you feel comfortable commenting here. Uh, sure, um, I, I kind of touched on it before that um, this is an area where we're trying to make some moves. It, it, it's hard at the provincial level where people are just coming in for one, but I think it, I personally think it needs to be a trickle down effect that we need to take advantage of what we've slowly and eventually been able to achieve with uh, at the Olympics get it down through the, uh, the, the developmental games and uh, franchise holders that control them. And then we can bring it down to the provincial level. It'd be my thoughts, but there's some numbers there to, to, to think about. And, and maybe next slide, um, Helen, the, the, the whole idea of that segment was that you have some, a tool, you can almost make a list of all the things that you need, that the, um, the, the organizer or the team needs to address. Do they want you to do this? Do they want you to do that? So set up a, um, a job description. And as you set up that job description, that not only defines your value, but then you can start putting a, you know, a number to that value to the organization. Um, this is maybe a bit intimidating. People say, this is all just crazy because sports don't have the money. They're just going to say, we can't do it. But a couple of things. One is, there is support from on the podium for this position paper and the kind of numbers that were put out there. They're not going to get involved in the granular level of the numbers, but they are supportive of the concept that the uh, positions get paid. Um, and, and as pointed out before, others on the team are getting paid. So it is a reasonable discussion to have. And one of the things that I found a bit useful in the past, especially if you're getting started out, sports always cry poor. So one way to, I think that is a consideration is to say, okay, um, let's start with something much less than what I'm asking. Do it for six months or a year, and then we'll revisit it. And, and as you, uh, once you sort of break the ice with them or get over that barrier that it needs to be a volunteer position, then you can start to get the, the value up to a more reasonable level. So that's, that's one consideration to do. Um, the bottom line is, you need to kind of put on paper or, or organize all the, the things that are involved with the sport to create that job position and then have sort of get it structured so that, um, and, and that's where the next portion of the tack is going to come in, that uh, at the start, you may just start 
with a, a letter to the the event organizers or the team and saying these are all the things you want me to do you know um and, and these are the things i would expect from you in terms of um payment and timelines but it makes a lot more sense especially when we talked previously about the professionalization of sport to have a more formal agreement and so um team is going to present a, a contract template that can be modified for individuals and i we think will be of, of use so um over to you, Tina. Thank you, Bob. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, I, we have a poll question um, here for everyone to respond to. Um, if you can uh, tell us whether you have a written contract, yes or no. I'll just wait a few more seconds. They're still coming in. There you go. Can you see okay, that? so yeah, so 69% of you say no and 31% do have a written contract. Um, so uh, this, uh, this is a good way to talk, a good time to talk about our contract. Uh, next slide, please. So we, uh, the committee decided that it would be useful to develop a contract um, for the membership uh, to use when you're starting to work with an organization. Um, to do this, uh, I collected several contacts or contracts from CASM members who graciously agreed to share them with the committee. Um, we reviewed them and we found some commonality, but uh, actually they were quite, they were quite different in ways. Um, so we submitted them to a sports, sports lawyer, Stephen Indig in Ottawa, who uh, wrote the template for us. Um, you know, it's intended to be used uh, to define the agreement, uh, like Bob said, to, to really make it professional. Um, we, uh, you can use it if you are not offered a contract or if you are offered a contract, you can use this one to compare to the one that you're given. And we want to make sure it includes all the relevant details uh, from a medical perspective. Um, things such as payment, uh, what will be covered, time commitment, medical record keeping, insurance coverage, um, the time length of the job, uh, things like that, that are very important that um, from a medical perspective need to be included. Um, the contract template is meant to be a guide. It can be adapted to your needs and adjusted as necessary. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, just a little uh, small sample from the contract. Um, so you can see how we gave some options here, um, uh, such as uh, for payment, um, and you can choose uh, which one would apply to you, or you can insert your own details, um, such as uh, a, in the section there where it gives you A, B, or C as options. Um, so just a little, uh, just a little sample to show you what it looks like on the section on fees and payments. Um, the template will be on the CASM website in French and English, and we hope you find it very useful. Uh, so thank you, and I'll pass it over to Kathy. Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks so much for those uh, presentations. So on the uh, CASM website, it's in the members section only, and it'll be in uh, two specific spots on the website. One is under the uh, team physician, and you can see it says there the remuneration guidelines. And the, the um, other place will be under members resource, just above the team physician there. And... Um, <clears throat> it will be under uh, position statements. So it will be in a couple of spots there. And if we can go to the next slide. Um, we are gonna open it up for a question and answer. I have a few questions that I'm gonna go through now. And just for those that weren't on the start of the, uh, the webinar, um, you can put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom if you scroll down and put your cursor on the bottom, you'll see a Q and A. If you're uh, wanting to speak, um, please raise your hand and Helen will click you off mute. Uh, when she does that, please know that you'll only be on the audio. 
And so we ask that you give your full name as well as uh, your location. Um, so while we're waiting, uh, a couple of things have come up. First, uh, Richard Gowdy did want to know if wine was going to be offered. And um, uh, that's slightly difficult, Richard, but uh, we cheers, cheers to you, Richard. Um, other things, uh, we will be offering a French version. And we've just been back and forth with the, uh, with the Quebec Society and Michelle Garon has kindly offered her sister to uh, translate, um, uh, translate the documents uh, for the use of uh, this on their website as well. Uh, Michael McKay, I don't know if that's pronounced correctly. My name is Mackay, but more people pronounce it as McKay, uh, is wondering uh, if there is greater interest uh, in providing sport sporting event coverage. Is that interest going up or down? And wondered what, uh, what uh, maybe Bob knows about that in terms of... Um, I, I don't, I, I don't, I, I can't answer it for sure. What I can say is, um, uh, there was a period of a few years ago where we were getting a lot less applicants to uh, for games, and we were having a lot more trouble finding um, uh, positions to cover teams. There was a lot more advertising to last minute advertising to find people to go. It seems to be less now, so that's good. Um, but I, we clearly there across the board, people tend to be under remunerated. I, I did want to take advantage since you gave me the floor, Kathy, to add something to, to Tina's thing that I think the contract can be is important, even if the zero, the, the dollar amount is zero, because it is those things about who owns the records, are, is there insurance in place, uh, uh, confidentiality, um, all those things that are important need to be in a contract, even if it's, it's so contracts are not just about dollars and cents. Um, so I would encourage everybody to do that. And, and if you put down in the contract, the job description it becomes harder and harder for the organization to say, we expect you to do all that for free, you know, so. Also, there was a question around uh, if this, um, this webinar will be recorded and it is being recorded and it will be posted on the members side again under team physician. Um, any other questions? I would like to also say that uh, it's been great working with, wonderful working with the committee. And when I put the call out to get volunteers, there were so many volunteers, I hated to turn people down. Um, we tried to keep it to a manageable number. So I took the, the first six that applied, you jumped on it. And uh, it just happened that you were from all across Canada with, with Tina on the East Coast and, and several of you on the West Coast. So, so thanks very much. And sorry for the people that we had to turn down and we appreciate uh, you, uh, you volunteering. So uh, Kathy, um, uh, you may have just missed it, but there's another question from Jeff Perkis in the uh, Q and A. Um, would you like me to read it out? I, for sure, go ahead. Uh, I just see uh, it as well. Yeah, okay, great. I didn't know you saw it. Um, to, uh, for Bob, uh, you mentioned the OTP physician uh, rate. Um, can you outline the process by which the NSO is applied to OTP for funding for physician event coverage services? And is it your perspective that some NSOs may receive more money per event than they pass on to the physicians? and redirect funds elsewhere in the organization. And um, I know that occurs. And uh, maybe Bob, you could speak to that. So a couple of points. One is not all sports are run through on the podium in terms of funding. It's only the targeted sports. But if we do look at those targeted sports, the ones that are metal potential at the Olympics, Paralympics, um, they do get funding and the, and the sports put together a budget and say, we have these events we need to run, we need this personnel to run the events, and this is what it's going to cost. So you're right, there is um, some, 
I'm aware also of instances where the sport has said we need X amount of money for physicians, but it never ends up going to the physician. And, uh, and I will say, um, we brought this up with On the Podium on multiple occasions for an audit, and they, um, they're not enthusiastic about doing the audit, as shall I say. So I think that the other way to approach this is to, if you're with a sport that's targeted, that you know gets money from On the Podium, is to ask them, what, when, what did you budget for, for, and don't just put it just as physicians, I would suggest, but say, how, do, what, how is the budgeting working for the healthcare? It'd be therapists, massage, strength and conditioning, and, and on the whole people, uh, the whole group. And then, you know, um, once you found out what they budgeted you for, then you're in a better position to, to negotiate that money or make sure that it gets, flows through to you. Or they know that they're someone's monitoring what they're doing, so they're less likely to uh, reassign it to general revenues. You know, I, I'm going to jump in here as well because I have also with Bob been on uh, the conversations about this. And, you know, for physicians uh, that work with national sporting organizations, know that each sport is meant to have a line that uh, where they say that how they're going to remunerate for their physician services. And so there, there is no expectation from on the podium that any sports would require free physician services or that any sport would underpay a physician at submarket rates. And so if you work with a national team and you are putting in a lot of hours and you're getting paid not a lot, um, that, that's not like on the podium as not condone that. They, they may not be auditing it and they may not be aware, but don't if a sport tells you like, we don't have the money for it, they do. They've just chosen to allocate it differently. And so how some you, sport. yeah, and how you Archie choose to be get involved. money from the podium. Badminton doesn't get money from on the podium. Yeah, field hockey doesn't get money from on the podium. You know, but uh, but the sports that are targeted through through OTP, it is a line item, so that people need to be aware of that. Yeah, sorry, I, I should. Bob is right. It is uh, on the podium supported sports, but uh, but if you're in one of those positions, um, it is okay to you know, ask for market compensation or remuneration if you feel you deserve it. And I think the trickle down effect is if, if, if that's done more broadly, then it helps us in dealing with the other sports that uh, to, to sort of, it becomes the market rate. So we do have a couple more questions as well from one from uh, M Melina uh, Thibodeau who asks, uh, do you know how much IST are paid for major events? For instance, uh, physio at Olympics, Commonwealth Games, et cetera, for comparison. I don't, uh, I think I, it. I, 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 I will only, because they mentioned the Olympics in the, in the games, I'll only add that they don't get paid specifically to be at the Olympics, but their contract for the year with the sport includes the Olympics, so they end up being paid as part of their salary while they're at the games, which historically has been different than the core practitioners who are engaged just for the games. So, um, but, but some of the people who are uh, in, in the uh, in a lead positions who have therapists at the games can comment about that, like, like Patty and Steve and Marnie. Yeah, our, when we travel to like our world championships and Olympics, we uh, we pay those uh, the staff to come. Some of them aren't on salary, um, so it, it is like a daily honorarium. Yeah, it was I mean, it's a daily honorarium for physio massage, and it, I think the physios are paid a little bit more um, than the massage therapists and strength and conditioning, and it's somewhere between three and five hundred dollars. With basketball, our HE and PT are on contract, and their contract covers the entire competitive season, including all of the travel events. Okay. So Lindsay Bradley asks, are your travel costs, meals, hi, Lindsay, uh, et cetera, supposed to be included in your OTP team physician allocation, or is that a separate line in the budget? Who would like to address that? It really depends. And, you know, I go back to uh, some of the earlier comments about medical advisor versus consultant versus CMO. 
Um, but at the end of the day, it depends on the, the nature of the contract you have with the sport. And if there's a line item that says we're going to pay you X and you're going to do Y and that includes travel, um, and that's the nature of my contract with Athletics Canada, then you may not be paid separately for travel. But, uh, but if, if that's not in there, it's okay for you to say this is outside our contract and I, you know, the daily rate for travel because I'm missing my office would be this. And Nolan Rowe asks, thanks for the great discussion. You had mentioned that physicians from other Commonwealth countries like Australia are getting paid. Uh, does anyone know how much? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I traveled with the, the Canadian soccer team many years ago and uh, we, um, uh, you know, we talked to other countries and it was, all I can say is it was considerably more. And they usually had, you know, not only one doctor, they'd have an orthopedic surgeon, a family doctor, a this, a that, uh, that they had with them, especially for the US team. Yeah, my experience in athletics is the team physicians worldwide are paid about double what I make for in, in Canada. And, uh, and while I travel by myself to a major games, it's not uncommon for teams to have two to four doctors. So, and the one comment I'll add to that is, um, it's we're not bottom of the pack because our American colleagues will often pay to travel with a team. Of course, they get compensated differently and and aren't uh, tied to a um, uh, government rates. And it boils down to the sports get a, a budget from Sport Canada, way less if they're not a targeted sport. And out of that budget, they have to run everything. So they're making hard decisions. But if we don't force, I'm sounding like a union leader here, but if we don't force the issue, it will never happen. I mean, if we sort of say the only way you're gonna get a physician is because you're paying somebody who's giving you expertise, not just running the concession or collecting tickets, but is actually taking on a high profile, very valuable job for you that is worth something like coaches are and other people, that, that then they start to reallocate and make the ask from Sport Canada that we need money to do this the same way as the sports to deal with OTP have made that case. The, uh, uh, another question uh, is directed towards, uh, I guess, Bob, Patty and Steve, and that is um, someone's asking about billing codes for event coverage in BC, or if you know anything about that. There is not. <laughs> It's a short answer, and but this is where that double billing comes in. If I get um, five hundred dollars from the BC Lions to cover a Lions game, or from the Whitecaps to cover a Whitecaps game, and I go to the game and I try to bill for each uh, interaction I have while I'm getting that honorarium for the event, that's probably not appropriate. Now, if I see them in the office the next day, I'll bill for it. If I you know, but uh, um, I, I'm not aware of any fee code. In fact, the other, just aside from this, we've struggled for a long time. Is there a way we can get some charitable receipt or something else for the time that we donate? And, and that has, um, I think they've somehow been able to do that in Quebec, but I haven't been able to hear of any other jurisdictions that have been able to make that work. But if people have ideas about that, that would be a valuable thing that we can do for events. I'll jump here and add what I have done in the past. Um, this is mostly when covering varsity sport, um, especially when you're not being paid to be at the event, like Bob says, is I, if I'm seeing players afterwards, I will bill a house call for it. It's a little more remunerative than your office visit. Um, I figure I'm going to them to provide the services and I've not had problems billing that over the last 20 years in Alberta. It might be a problem if an orthopedic surgeon bills a house cow. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, some people have put some comments in the chat. So I'm gonna go back and forth to the Q&A and chat. And we have one here from uh, Stuart Gershman who says, I often work with junior A level hockey players who come from the States. I use a college of physician and surgeons template for a foreign consent form. It is probably enough, but wondering if CASM has a specific one. Uh, thanks. He's from Victoria. Does anyone know if, uh, I don't think CASM has a specific form other than the 
the physician and surgeons. Okay. We, uh, uh, oh. and uh, Kathy, I can just respond just to a little bit with that. I, I look after help out with the major junior team in Victoria, and we often have U.S. players coming in, and we have a uh, Western Hockey League specific consent form um, that are signed. It's, it's signed universally by players coming in before they actually receive medical attention, um, but it's not a chasm specific one, but uh, sounds like a good project to volunteer for us too. There is a CMPA one that has uh, never been tested in the courts, but is recommended to obtain the governing law and jurisdiction one. And we do the same thing with the BC Lions where half the team is American. It's part of preseason physicals. <laughs> like basically if they don't sign the form, <laughs> that's, they don't go any further, which is <laughs> maybe coercion, but it's part of the process. Everybody knows it. And I have uh, some great comments here from the infamous Andrew Pipe. Hello, Andrew. Great to see you here. Uh, and he says, great work. Congratulations to all. And thanks for all your efforts on our behalf. I think it is important that CASM establish or publish a revised rate card with relatively narrow ranges so that individual docs have a clear basis for their discussion, which has the gravitas of the CASM's recommendations, expectations behind them as they begin discussions with sport organizations. Um, and that all of our members, you're a little long-winded, Andrew, uh, tonight, uh, I'll keep going. And that all of our members are encouraged to use this to open their discussions. Uh, this, we should really unmute uh, Andrew, I think here and let him have a chat with us. Uh, this will have an impact across the sport community as organizations, organizations become aware of this standard. Ah, I think we have Andrew joining us. Do, do we have Andrew? Ah, I see his name there. Andrew. Yeah, thank you very much. I think you, you've said all that I would wanted to say and, and most important are the thanks that I, I would offer to you. <laughs> great, to great to have you here, Andrew. Thanks so much. Um, so rate card uh, for sure. Uh, and um, Andrew, what would you put to, for the wage range? I don't know, but I would I would tend to make it a narrow one. I think the degree to which you provide uh, too much breadth um, weakens the strength of the document, frankly. Um, and so, uh, you know, I do, and I think you've delineated very well all of the, the variables that could go into those ranges, but. Um, I think just from looking at the data that you've acquired and, and the patterns of, 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 of practice of our colleagues, you can probably come up with pretty good, pretty good figures that, that are, 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 I would argue for, for them, that range being narrow. Uh, and uh, I, I think, you know, among the arguments that we can make in addition to the, the very clever, clear and clever ones that you've articulated, Bob, Sport organizations always talk about their greatest asset being their athletes, and, and yet, and they're completely prepared to pay accountants and lawyers and communication specialists and public relations and press officers, uh, and yet the obvious, the, the actual care of what they deem to be their most important and most valuable asset has been, um, you know, subject to the kind of the volunteerism that we're all, we're all familiar with. And, and I think that's that's an argument that needs to continually to be expressed in, in discussions with sport organizations. The only other comment I'll make and then I shut up is that I think we also want to recognize that many of us and many on this call, I'm sure, on this um, volunteer to be part of committees for sport organizations and um, are very clear that those are voluntary, um, that that's voluntary participation, et cetera, et cetera. And, and um, so those expectations or the expectations of being able to be a volunteer as opposed to being a deliverer of clinical services, if I can make that distinction, um, should also be, be recognized in any documents that emerge. Thanks very much, Andrew. Uh, um, I, Andrew, I'll just reinforce what you said. I've had great success of reminding the sports that their lawyers do not work for free and their accountants do not work for free. And uh, that's that sort of hits home with them often. So that's that's it's important to reinforce that for people. 
Sorry, Kathy. Can I add, Kathy Kim, I'm interested um, if Andrew, his comment about narrowing the range, the people that are on this call, if they can maybe put something into the Q&A or the chat, if those who have read the recommendations, do they think our ranges are too high, too low, too excessive? I mean, we, we based our comments around the feedback in the survey, but it was somewhat of a collegial understanding and, and agreements with how we came up with the numbers. I'd be interested to know what the people who are using it, if they think this is a fair value for their time. Maybe not the QA, maybe they can just even give feedback to you over the next few days. Yeah. Well, I think, I think this was a good start. We have a document, it's complete. And uh, we don't wait nine years uh, till the next edition. You know, this should be a living document, I think. And, um, um, and we can keep this going in, um, in some way through the board and making sure that we're, we're doing updates a little more often. I do have a, a comment and question from uh, Tim Rendesbacher. Hi, Tim. Uh, he has this wonderful review. Any strategies for mitigating the risk of, it's a good point, of other MDs uh, stepping over us to volunteer for these positions? Well, one is if you have to have the, uh, I don't know, go ahead. What do you think, Bob? Oh, I, or anyone? I, I do. I didn't have any particular comments. It's 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 an issue. At least the sports will make you think it's an issue, and that's one reason I've sort of sometimes, if I sense, if the sport says we can't do it, I say, listen, let's just start small, and then once they get the idea that there is some value, you maybe undervalue yourself at the start. But then after a year when you've developed the relationships, because remember at the start, you're a bit of an unknown to them. And, and, uh, and when we hire a new employee, we often start off at a lower uh, salary until they go through the probationary period or get some experience and then we increase their salary. So you can, that's one strategy is to maybe start off a little lower than you'd like with a planned review in X amount of time. And then you can start to get it back up to a, a, an appropriate range. But also, I think if the CASM uh, membership, if we're solid in our support of these documents, and if the teams are requiring that you have a CASM diploma, then I think that will also be helpful if, if one of the requirements is that you have to have a, a CASM, be a CASM member. But yeah, it, no, you're, you're absolutely right, Kathy, but I will say the sports will just go without. I mean, with Patty, you would. I, yeah. would Reinforce. We've had the situation where there are some sports that are such high risk. They've had deaths on the World Cup, <laughs> like not just one death, and yet they refused to take a physician because it would cost them money. And so we actually, at Sports Medicine Advisory Council, came up with a policy paper listing the sports that needed to take a physician because of the risks involved in those sports, and there still is not complete buy-in. Right, Patty? It is an issue that um, that is a challenge for sure. And um, you know, we, we've we've spoken to in the podium about it and, and made them aware of like our how we feel about it. And uh, I know they don't disagree, but you know, the 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 term that gets thrown around a lot is there are no new there's no new money, and so whatever is in the system, the sports have to make do and. Um, but, but this is part of the advocacy on the, the Sport Medicine Advisory Council that we do for physician remuneration. And it, and it doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to ask. It just means we have to just recognize some of the barriers and, and, and deal with them, that's all. Yeah, and you know, the, the comment I would make about the, the person who had asked about, you know, physicians coming in and volunteering underneath them is that um, if you know what you're doing and you're really good in the experience, it won't take the sport long to realize they want you to be involved. And, uh, and I've, I've seen that uh, a number of times. And so, um, you know, it's okay to feel free to stick to your guns. Um, th there may be times when, you, you know, experienced physicians or good physicians are passed over, but uh, in my experience, it, it won't be long before they circle back because what the sports really want is someone who knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, Elliot Wong 
uh, says, thanks for putting this together. Have physicians run into situations where the team does not arrange <laughs> for liability insurance for international events, but instead the team mandates that the physician arranges their own medical insurance. Uh, would anyone like to comment on that? I've had that personally, and I've just sort of, we've uh, just said, um, I'll arrange it as long as you're going to pay for it. And if they say they can't afford it, then it just becomes a hard line in the sand for me that I am not, you know, sometimes you still get sucked in and the class, you know, but you, you um, I think that's a hard line in the sand for me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody else has different thoughts. Uh, so Andy Marshall has a comment. Certainly in my experience, sports know that they can get MDs to do it for less or free and other healthcare providers, Cairo will do it. I've worked at all levels and never gotten the numbers suggested in the slides. Well, need to be tough there, Andy. <laughs> Uh, Kathy, Robert Foxford has raised his hands. Oh, Just bring him in here. For sure. Robert Foxford. Oh, hey. Uh, hey, sorry. Uh, I'm late to the discussion. I just left 12 hours of COVID ER, so uh, I missed a lot of the conversation. Um, I know Bob McCormick and I have talked about this before, but a lot of the funding comes from OTP. And OTP says, well, we gave Sport X... $400 a day for every day of declared physician interventions. And of course the 400 or the 700 never gets to the physician. And when that's pointed out to OTP, they just shrug their shoulders and say, so what they've really, and I, I presented that dilemma to the head of OTP and it just wasn't an area of interest to them. So I'm just venting a little bit that when I was involved, it was frustrating that OTP gave the money and it was not used for such. And, and maybe I'm using a tough word, but it was, it was somewhat fraudulent. And the teams just say, well, yeah, they gave us that, but you know, it went for this, it went for that. But it was, you know, money was directly claimed under physician days to pay physicians. So it's tough. And I echo what Andy says, as long as there are physicians who are willing to do it for free, there'll be a bit of a challenge. Now there'd be somebody who are willing to do it for free and they may not be a dip sport med and they may not be good or they may be terrific, but that's, that's always an uphill battle because traveling with our sports team is a bit of an honor and a privilege. And it, it does go beyond being a job, although it is also a job. So those are some of the challenges. Um, I must say the OTP always used to really piss me off, but uh, they didn't really seem to care that they gave the money to go to medical and then didn't go. Thank you for listening. Yeah, you know, uh, the, I, I, I comment on that. It, it is frustrating. And on the podium, while they acknowledge the importance of having a well-developed IST that includes a physician, they uh, are not able or interested in auditing uh, or doing a strict audit on where the money ends up going. I do think, though, that the comment I've made earlier, not certain if you heard it, is that for on the podium supported teams, there is money at you know market rates for a physician and so it's okay for you to request to be paid at you know a reasonable rate uh that may not always work but but as you point out that money has been allocated on the pudding for that purpose and it's it's reasonable to ask for it patty do you know if that are those figures public can you go to own the podium and say what is the line item for physicians in athletics you know, the sport knows, but I, I, I don't think it's public. And I, yeah, that's a good question. We, sh we should ask that on the next Met call. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll find it on Monday. <laughs> uh, certainly the, the sport knows, you know, like the, the high performance director and the CEO will know because they, they have to present it to own the podium, their plan and include the line items. What happens after that meeting is um, not always clear. Um, so we have time for a couple more questions. Um, 
Michael McKay uh, or Mackay, uh, would CASM like to see consistency across Canada as far as physician remuneration, or is it really up to the physician and the sporting group they work with? Um, and I think that's why we've put out this uh, physician uh, statement is to try to help get that consistency. Um, and I'm thinking that possibly answers that question. We have Stephanie Melanson from New Brunswick. Hello. Uh, thank you for this great document. It helps to negotiate. We had a thank you from Laura Cruz. We have uh, Penny Bayless. And she says, it sounds like OTP are paying lip service with this attitude needs to change. Is there a way to have some external pressure on OTP to fund medical staff properly? Um, Patty may comment, but this SMAC group that he and I are both on, I, I, that's one of the things we dry, or do discuss. And there is a plan to revisit um, accreditation and payment of healthcare providers uh, for a few OTP sports. So um, it is an ongoing process. We're, what, we actually brought our position paper to go on the podium to make sure we weren't going to be off base and, 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 and so that they were thought it was reasonable. But I think you some good points have been brought up tonight that we can bring back to our next meeting, which I think is this Monday evening, if I'm my calendar reminds me is so we will we'll, we'll continue to press that and uh, if people have real issues that way. Um, the CMOs of each of the Canadian sports institutes are involved in that group. Um, so there's a few others that are on the call and, uh, and, 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 and Patty and I and Andy Marshall and Mike Wilkinson as well. Great. Super. Well, um, we don't have uh, other questions and we're almost at 930. Perfect timing. Uh, so, uh, Steve uh, and I as co-chairs want to thank you all. Uh, it's been a tremendous time. Our first meeting was May 1st and uh, we've chugged through the different topics together. It's been great uh, uh, getting to know you all. Uh, also, thanks for the CASM membership for coming out this evening and a special thanks to Helen and Dawn uh, who've worked very hard in evenings and helping us set up Zoom calls and figuring out polls and all kinds of things. So, so thanks very much and um, everyone have a great night.